Hey there, YouTube, and welcome to Ask a Maestro. Today's question comes from Joyce Chen, who asks, How do all of the string players in an orchestra move their bows in unison? Well, Joyce, great question. Easy answer. It says to in their music. Thanks for watching. Ask a Maestro. <laughs> of course, it's much more complicated than that. But this is actually a great question because this hypnotic ebb and flow of 50 or 60 string players in an orchestra is one of the visual elements that people love about going to orchestral concerts. Okay, before we get into this, let's take a look at the bow itself. There are a few different components, one of which is the wood part of the bow, which is just called the stick. Then there are all of these hairs, and I'll get up close here. These are actually horse hairs. Now, I always tell little kids that it doesn't hurt the horse when we take their hairs to make the bow, that it's just like getting a haircut. But for all I know, it's torture. It probably doesn't hurt the horse. Right? We think that the idea of bowing a stringed instrument comes from the horse cultures of Central Asia in like the first millennium AD. They were already using horse-strung bows to hunt with, and at some point somebody just had the idea of playing a string instrument. Okay, there's two more elements of the bow that we should talk about. This end is called the tip, and this end is called the frog. So there are two directions that we can bow in. There is from the frog, to the tip, which is called the down bow, and there's from the tip to the frog, which is called an up bow. And in fact, there are symbols in musical notation that we use to describe this, down bow and up bow. So does it matter which direction you're actually bowing in? Well, not unless you care about what the music sounds like. Here's what I mean. The different bowing directions actually have different qualities naturally associated with them, because the frog is actually where the bow is the most powerful. It's closest to my center of gravity, so I can make the strongest sounds here. And the tip is where the bow is the weakest. So there's a natural dither or decay on the down bow, and the opposite on the up bow. So if you want to shape the music in a particular way, there will be a combination of down bows and up bows that makes for the most natural interpretation. So then, who decides which direction the bows are going to go? Sometimes the composer might write those down bow and up bow symbols directly into the music. If the composer hasn't written the bowing into the music, then the conductor, if he or she is a string player, might mark the parts with down bows or up bows. Sometimes the conductor marks the down bows or up bows even if they're not a string player, and that leads to interesting results. Most of the time, the question of the bowing falls to the principles of the string sections, with the major responsibility lying with the concertmaster. That's one of the things that makes that job a special and important role in the orchestra. Now, these penciled-in notations for down bow and up bow are a relatively new thing in classical music, which means by our standards that they're like maybe 150 or 200 years old as opposed to, say, 500 years old. Now, there were three things that happened around the turn of the 19th century that led to our contemporary habit of marking bowings into our parts with a pencil. The first was that orchestras were getting bigger and bigger. So in the Baroque era, you might have only had three or four players. They could certainly work out the bowings just among themselves. Now, it was not necessarily practical to work that out among 10 or 12 or 14 musicians. It was easier if it was just marked into their parts. The second thing that happened was that composers began writing music that didn't rely on the familiar patterns from the Baroque and Classical era. There were often big sweeping melodies that were open to interpretation about how you might bow them. And the third thing that happened was Napoleon's expedition to Egypt in 1795. Napoleon brought with him a scientific expedition, and these scientists were making use of a brand new technology, the modern graphite pencil. Because of this, pencils became widespread in Europe, and now it became practical for musicians to be able to mark their parts in the context of a rehearsal. Before, it wouldn't have made sense to dip your quill into a pot of ink and write that on your music stand. The ink would be dripping, you'd have to get a blotter out, and then you couldn't even get rid of it if you wanted to change something. So nowadays, musicians will mark these bowings into their parts, 
and for the most part, orchestras bow together in unison. But sometimes people do think outside the box. One such person is this guy, Carlos Kleiber, by general reckoning the greatest conductor of the 20th century. Let's just not argue about that. He would often use free bowing. This has a few effects. First of all, if you have a combination of up bows and down bows going, it leads to a more uniform kind of blanket of sound. The other thing is, it lets people just play their hearts out. There's like this seething carpet of snakes going through the orchestra, people going all over the place. Now there's one more wrench that I'm going to throw into this whole idea of orchestral bowing. That's that the instruments that we play now in an orchestra, the violins, the violas, like this, nothing better, and the cellos are all members of the violin family. But there is an older family of string instruments called the viol family. And musicians who play the viol held their bows underhand and bowed like this. Let's take a look at a viol consort called Hesperian 21, which is led by this amazing viol player and musical historian named Jordi Saval. You'll notice that they play with their up bows on the strong beats and down bows on the weak beats. Okay, let's pause here for a second and talk about this dude because how can you not? Let's just say this. If you're the director of this video and the group shows up and it turns out that there is a wizard playing the drums, your job is done. Now, it doesn't hurt that he plays a neon teal drum and has a matching tambourine to go with it. All right, well, that dude is badass, and that's basically everything that I have to say about Boeing. So YouTube, that brings to an end this edition of Ask a Maestro. Please leave your musical questions in the comments, and I'll get to them as soon as I can. Until then, go play an instrument or sing a song, and goodbye, everyone.